Hey everyone, this is Liam Eagle. I'm the editor here at the Web Host Industry Review, and I'd like to welcome you all to another of our WER webinars. Uh, today's session is uh, entitled uh, CDP Enterprise Edition, First Look at Industrial Strength Storage and Advanced Data Protection for Windows and Linux Servers. And it will feature a presentation from Ash Patel, who is a sales engineer at R1 Soft. Um, I'll let Ash introduce himself in a moment, and, uh, and I'll turn things right over to him. But before I do, I just wanted to uh, share a few housekeeping notes. Um, there's going to be some time at the end for a Q&A, uh, but if you want to submit your questions throughout the presentation, I'll keep an eye on them, and if there's something really relevant to what's being said comes up, I'll try to find a polite spot to interrupt and sort of put the, the questions to him as, as he presents. Um, we'll also have a record of all the questions that are asked, so if we don't get to yours, uh, don't worry, and someone will follow, you, follow up with you a after the fact. And finally, if you, you have a question that you'd rather not, you know, ask in front of everyone, so to speak, um, the contact information for, for our presenters will be on screen during the Q&A period. Uh, and the slides will be available after the webinar. Uh, Ash is going to have his contact info on screen at the end, so you can contact him, or you can respond to the follow-up email you'll get. And, uh, of course, there'll be a video archive of the session uh, archived on the WER website early next week. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Ash and uh, let him introduce himself. Hello everyone, my name is Ash Patel and as Liam said, I am the sales engineer over here at, uh, at R1 Soft. Um, thank you for attending our uh, latest webinar today. It's kind of uh, the first webinar that we've done uh, as an introduction to the CDP3 Enterprise uh, addition to our product. And today we're going to focus mainly on the, the new features uh, within the product and the, the main parts of those really are, uh, are a look at the, the storage and the uh, and advanced data protection. So jumping right into, uh, into things, um, let's uh, kind of go over the, a little overview of what we will be covering today. Uh, first, we're going to just talk a little bit about the, the benefits of CDP over traditional backup methods and kind of look at some of the, the challenges when it comes to, uh, to restoring and backing up files and some of the uh, misconceptions that, that people have when it comes to actually doing backups. Uh, then we'll transition into a look uh, into the, the storage, uh, the new architecture in CDP3 and take a closer look. Uh, at a comparison between what you're used to in version 2 and uh, in version 3. Uh, and lastly, we'll look at things such as uh, the scalability and uh, the portability of your mission-critical data. So why, uh, why care about continuous data protection, or CDP? Um, number one, is, uh, the number one performance problem for servers is disk audio. In, uh, in web hosting environments where you have busy web and application and database servers and, uh, and multiple users on machines, uh, admins are, are well aware of uh, the limitations they face when it comes to disk I.O. And traditional methods such as using PAR and RSync, uh, which have just numerous uh, bad performances when it comes to uh, running daily backups no longer really cut it. Um, so R1 Soft really fits that out of space when it comes to reducing the, the disk audio footprint uh, when it comes to backups. Number two, server disk IO is even worse in cloud and virtualized environments, mainly because you're, you have multiple virtual environments all competing for, uh, for limited resources. So just uh, one thing that we want to uh, kind of explain why uh, backups can be such a headache. Um, it actually boils down to uh, a lot of the, the overhead associated with, uh, with file and folder metadata. And anybody who knows this uh, or anybody who kind of wants to see this firsthand need only run uh, a couple of, of tests. Um, first, try to, uh, try to do just uh, a regular old. Uh, copy of 1 million 1K files, which is 1 gig, and see how long it takes to copy that directory. And then try to do that same copy with, uh, with one, 1 gigabyte file. And you'll find that it takes 10 times longer to do it uh, to copy the, the 1 million individual files. When it comes to restore, it's even worse. It takes 20 times as longer 
to restore one one gig file as opposed to restoring one million indi individual one k files. So that is pretty evident that backing up and restoring individual files and folders is not the the optimal solution when uh, when it comes to backups. Um, running into this uh, kind of in a, a deeper explanation, um, why is it is it so slow? It's because of the, the overhead restore related to the journaling within the, the file system needed to, uh, to, to create files. Every time a file is created, it's written to a journal. The more files that, that you are creating, the more journaling that's, uh, that's going to that's gonna happen. Um, the, the worst case performances that we've seen have been on NTFS and EXT3 and, uh, and 4. And then some older Unix variants actually have ways to tune the file system and temporarily disable this. But for right now, in Linux, most of the time, that is not an option. So how does R1 soft help in this, this environment? Number one, we are block-based. So we are not looking at individual files and folders. We go below the file, below the file system, and down to the sector level on, a, on the, the physical disk. So the amount of files and folders that you actually have residing on uh, any file system is, uh, is not really of, of any concern to us. Uh, number two, we, uh, we allow for asynchronous replication, CDP. And uh, most replications are completed within, uh, within minutes. Again, when, uh, when we're backing up at a block level, I often give the example that if you're working on a, a 20 meg PDF and you open it up for a brief moment and make one change to it, normal backup software would look at the metadata associated with that file and then back up the entire 20 megs again. With us, we go below the file, below the file system, and we look at where the file was actually written. And that minor change may have been written to one or two 4K block sectors on the physical disk. And so we, that is all that we would back up in, uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the incremental backup. So the result of that is the ability to, to really shorten the, the backup window. And the, the true benefit of that is decreased disk I.O. on, uh, on the, the system. So it's been, a, it's been a long time coming, and we know a lot of our customer base has been waiting, that CDP3 is finally here. And we hope that you've been kind of getting some of our uh, email blasts and press releases about all of its features and benefits. But if you haven't, we're going to give you a, a brief and quick synopsis of, uh, of everything that we're so excited about here at R1Soft. So the, from an architecture perspective, that the enterprise edition is the natural transition from the CDP2 enterprise to, uh, to, to version 3. It's still going to give you the, the multi-tenant backups. You're going to have the ability to back up uh, 30, 25, 30, however many machines you want to a single CDP server, depending upon, of course, uh, the, the level of your infrastructure and uh, the server resources you have on the back end. But it is completely a, a multi-tenant solution where you would back up multiple machines to a, of one backup server and manage all of those backups through one central web interface, which has been completely redesigned as, uh, as well. So going over just uh, what the, the major technology upgrades are, are in 3.0, and these are all things that, uh, that you asked for. You wanted faster backups. You wanted more scalable and durable disk safes. You wanted uh, file and folder excludes. Um, you were sick of that clunky, pale orange interface. So you wanted something that was uh, sleeker and, and sexier to actually manage your, your backups from. Um, you, you wanted the ability to have a simultaneous restores in the old R1 technology. We could only have one restore going uh, for a single server at, a, at any given time. And in version 2, there was also kind of a, an inexplicable limitation where uh, compression would have a very negative impact on, a, on actual throughput. And so we've actually introduced a new compression option in version 3, um, which from our tests has actually shown to speed up uh, backup tasks. So 
Uh, moving along here, the the first requirement that was that we really wanted to to address was the the speed of the backups. We realized that with uh, with our proprietary file format in version two, and uh, and the way that we were reading it for disk, it was not an optimal method for uh, for a large restore sets. So the, the R1 Soft's new proprietary file format uses uh, a BT a B tree data structure, and for those of you who are uh, familiar with uh, with B tree data structures, know that it's used commonly in, uh, in in databases and file systems, and it really uh, it, it allows for searches, uh, se sequential access and insertions and deletions of uh, of data. So think of it um, of as more or less uh, a portable and relational uh, data structure that, uh, that that we're using here. So a lot of the, the I/O load that we had before on the server side has now been offloaded uh, onto uh, into the the new data into the new uh, disk architecture. And Btree is uh, is also optimized for systems. That uh, that read and write large blocks of data, which, if you really think about it from a low per level perspective, is exactly what the R1 Soft CDP ser server is doing. So we're we're really excited about this new disk safe architecture, and uh, we know we've uh, we've tested it and gotten really pretty amazing results. So going over kind of a little comparison here of uh, of what you're used to and what uh, what we're we're kind of moving towards. Um, this safes in CDP2 um, stored block level data in one central uh, directory, which you configured as as a volume. In version three, you will have full manageability to uh, place data anywhere and anywhere on disk. We're giving you complete control of. Uh, the way that you organize your volumes and uh, the location uh, to which you write data. Um, the the old proprietary file format was one central dot data file and index file, and then a, a bitmap file to to reassemble that data. Uh, the the new block store here is a proprietary dot db file format with atomic journaling using uh, B trees to to store block level data, and that's what we just described. In, uh, in the previous slide. Now, scalability was uh, another issue in uh, in version two. Um, we kind of maxed out at uh, at an eight terabyte per disk per agent. Um, in version three, that uh, is up to a theoretical limit of 64 terabytes. And we'll uh, I won't comment on too much on that here because we're going to address it in uh, in an upcoming slide. Um, crash recovery. In version two, was very difficult. And for some reason, you had a you had a system crash or a power outage. Um, it would take a very long time to uh, to to check the integrity of uh, of the disk safe. And then even if if there was corruption, it was difficult to to be able to to restore them at all. Um, version three uses uh, acid transactions. It has a, an atomic commit rollback journal file, which uh, we will discuss in a, in a moment. But it's uh, it's highly reliable and highly robust. We've gotten it to a point where uh, we can run simultaneous backups, physically pull the plug on the backup server, and still recover all of our disk safes. Again, uh, location on disk. This is uh, this is completely. Uh, Managed by uh, by you, uh, portability was the the next biggest feature. In version two, once you once your data was on a single server, it was it was there to stay, unless you migrated the entire server. And in, in version three, not the case. You can uh, open and close disk safes and send that data anywhere you want, and uh, and begin making use of it. And we'll take a closer look at that in just a moment. Now uh, these are just uh, a few kind of uh, notes on uh, resource utilization for the people that are 
are looking to, to more finely tune their, uh, their CDP environment. Um, hey, CDP2 was, uh, was a memory hog when, uh, when it came to, to, to backups, restores, and browsing. There was uh, a fixed 144 meg that we used for, uh, for each disk safe that was open. In, uh, in version 3, we, have, we were able to cut that in, uh, in half to a default of, uh, of 60 megs and still be able to get the, uh, the type of performance that we wanted. Um, deleting and merging of recovery points in 2.0 was, uh, was, was very slow because of the, the new disk safe architecture. Um, it's probably been cut into uh, into half of uh, into half the size. In version three, in version two, um, we often faced uh, problems when it came to file fragmentation or uh, huge blocks of empty space within uh, within the the data block store. Um, in version three, um, it's a, if you actually perform a vacuum, um, yes, we we still will have empty chunks of space, but the the method by which we are able to vacuum out those, uh, those empty chunks of space um, is really more optimal than uh, essentially rewriting the, uh, the entire file as we almost had to do in, uh, in, in version 2. And, uh, and lastly here was uh, the, the issue of data deduplication. And uh, the scenario where a customer comes to us and says, OK, I'm backing up five server 2003 machines. Um, a lot of that data on the back end is going to be the same between all of those servers. Do you have the capability to, to do deduplications a lot, uh, be, between each of uh, between those data stores? In version two, it was just not possible because of the way that uh, the everything was related in within the, the index of the bitmap files. Um, it was just not feasible. In version three. Um, the, the new disk safe architecture is almost a stepping stone to, to introducing data deduplication. So with that, by having a, kind of a, an MD5 sum in a, a B-tree structure file format, it makes uh, scanning those B-tree structures and, uh, and, and looking for, uh, for duplicates very easy. So now, new for new features just on uh, on the, the Windows side here. Um, there is a new scriptable install. There is a silent device driver installation on 2000, 2008 R2 and Windows 7. For those of you who have actually installed on there, you I'm sure you're fully aware that every time you install the R1 Soft CDP agent, that a warning pops up about loading an unsigned driver. Um, that problem goes away in, uh, with the new CDP3 agent. Um, we also have support for 64K NTF cluster size support. So for those who are running it for, uh, in order to optimize your Exchange and SQL Server deployments, you can now back up those machines without having us ask you to, uh, to reformat uh, your partitions. Uh, Windows ACLs, NTFS ACL restores are fully supported now. This includes uh, system ACLs and discretionary, discretionary ACLs. And, uh, and lastly, there is improved support for, uh, for NTFS file compression. On, uh, on the Linux side, um, there is a, uh, a faster CDP device driver. We, uh, we started at, uh, at, the, at the starting line uh, for this new driver. We did not use any existing code. It is a completely new driver written from the ground up. Um, there is better support for, uh, for multi-path devices. And this is more related to, uh, to how we do device discovery. Those of you who are using multi-path before um, noticed that, uh, that we would see um, all the devices that were that essentially that dev mapper would see, uh, and not that a single one that it would pre present to the system. So if you had four paths to your backend storage, the CDP server would actually show you four paths or four individual devices in uh, on the the device page. 
it was re it really made for some uh, some confusing backup. So we've really uh, we stepped back and we said there's got to be an easier way to do this. And now on Linux and Windows, we discover devices based on uh, based on GUID and not on anything in uh, under dev name of a uh, device. There is uh, ext4 support now, which was uh, actually introduced late in, uh, in the 2.0 version. And lastly, there are RPM and apt installers. So no more downloading uh, a scriptable install from, uh, from our website. Um, simply add r one soft RPM and apt repositories to your servers and, uh, and manage your installation with your favorite package manager. Now, just uh, for a quick snapshot of, uh, of the device driver stack, uh, for those of you who did, who did not know uh, where a device driver actually sits, um, we are located directly below the, uh, the, the file system. We get uh, oftentimes get questions of, OK, we know that you sit somewhere in between the file system and the, the hard disk, but what if I'm using uh, Linux software RAID with LVM on, on top of that? Um, the, the answer is, is that we will be above all of that, anything to do with disk management and directly below the file system. Now, I wanted to just uh, give a, a couple point, pointers on, uh, on the new uh, industrial strength storage. Um, the, the new disk safe format has uh, an on-disk atomic write journal, and this really uh, protects the, the data integrity uh, against crashes and, uh, and power loss. Um, it's ACID compliant, which stands for atomic, consist consistent, isolated, and, uh, and durable. Um, and the best way to, to think about this is that with uh, atomic commit and ACID transactions, it's an all or nothing scenario. So it, when you begin a backup, we begin making changes, we, or we begin writing changes to the, the data store on the server side. That does not mean that those changes have been committed. Um, now, in between, uh, the, if, if the server for some reason crashes uh, before we actually have a chance to commit those transactions, there's nothing to worry about. The next time you boot up that machine, the disk safe is going to come up intact, and it's just not going to reflect the changes that were written before. And it's really this ability to have all or nothing commits that, uh, that ensures the, uh, the integrity of, uh, of, of the data. And a common uh, examples of uh, asset transactions are the creation of a, of a new recovery point, merging of a, of a rec recovery point, um, creation of, a, of an archive using an existing uh, recovery point, and backing up of a, of a storage configuration, all your partition tables and, uh, and your LVM configuration. So this is really the, the bread and butter behind the, the new industrial strength storage. This is why we have uh, so much confidence right now that we are as close to immune to the disk corruption as we can possibly get at, uh, at this point. And we invite you to test this out as well. If you want to run a backup and, and pull the plug, on the backup server, please, please do so and see if uh, if you can you can create any disk safe corruption. Now I'll I'll, I'll go come back to uh, to this slide in just a moment because I wanted to have to continue on with uh, with the the new disk safe technology. Um, with the new disk safes, again, you choose uh, where you uh, where you store. The, uh, the individual data. Uh, taking a closer look at, uh, at the, the files that you actually have on disk, we can see that here on the, on the bottom little screenshot um, within, uh, within that Linux environment that we have one central data store. And then when we begin a backup, we actually uh, keep a journal of all of the, file, of, of all of the, uh, the, the changes that we are planning to make. Um, when we're finished the backup, that's when we commit uh, all those file, all the all the changes from the journal into the, uh, the the central data store. 
And, uh, and also what you see here that you did not see in version 2 is, uh, is a, a metadata file. And it's that metadata file that houses all information about the disafe. It, it has uh, an archive of the recovery point. So within that, uh, and within that metadata is a small database instance which tells the server that I have recovery points from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday within, uh, within this data store. Now, uh, portable disk safe. This is uh, another feature that uh, really addresses more than just one concern. So one of the uh, biggest requirements or biggest, I'd say, headaches that we face uh, with CDP2 was the ability to back up remotely. Um, if somebody was at a, a remote office and wanted to back up a server off-site, the, the time that it took to, to do that initial feed um, often prohibited uh, even taking a, a full initial backup. Um, with version 2, the portable disk safe really addresses that problem because you have the ability to uh, take, a, take a local backup to a second hard drive or a, a USB disk um, and then uh, copy that data over using uh, a more sustainable protocol. You could use SCP or FTP or you could even burn it on disk or physically take it to an alternate location hook it up to, uh, to a CDP server, and then, uh, and then make use of it. Um, for those of you who are wondering, also, if, uh, if there are compatibility issues between uh, the, the various 3.0 products, the standard, the advanced, and the enterprise, the answer is no. The, the, the disk safes are fully portable between the standard, the advanced, and the enterprise. You can take a local backup on a, a standard edition machine, uh, and then you can copy that to save to an enterprise server in your data center, and you can pick it up, begin making use of it, and begin doing incrementals to uh, to that disk safe. Now, the, the the portability of the disk safe is as simple as close, copy, and open. So when you when you click on the the disk safe tab in CDP3, you have the option to select a disk safe and close it. What closing it is essentially doing is making sure that nothing is writing to, uh, to that disk safe. Uh, if, if any backup jobs are scheduled to run at a time when you have the disk safe closed, they will be postponed. Um, from there, you have the, uh, the option of using XCOPY, SCP, FTP, uh, whatever you want to get the, the data from point A to point B. And then the last step, would be to add the existing disk safe onto the new machine. So here we can see that when we add the existing disk safe, we have to uh, associate it with a certain agent that we have uh, configured within the system. Uh, we can give it a description, and then all we do is point to the path where, the, that, data, where that disk safe is located, and we can instantly pick it up. We can begin doing restores. We can begin doing bare metals. Uh, and we can even begin doing backups again. Uh, scalability. Um, in 3.0, there is a theoretical limit of uh, 64 terabytes and 128 terabytes per volume with compression. So again, think of it like this. If you have uh, dev SDA SDA, SDB, and SDC, each of those disks will have its own data store. Um, or uh, Let me step back for a second. If you have that SDA 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, each of those partitions will have its own data store. Each of those data stores for each of those individual partitions can scale up to 64 terabytes. And, uh, and the reason for that is that the, the new disk safe are format um, actually writes, uh, uh, has a page size of 32K. And we, we take that 32K and we have a, a max uh, page size of uh, 2 to the 31, which is 2 billion and some change. But doing the math there, it yields that uh, uh, roughly uh, a 64 terabyte uh, maximum. Now, I don't know if we'll ever see 
uh, a partition that's uh, that's 64 terabytes, but it's good to know that from a theoretical perspective that uh, that we are able to uh, to support it. And again, um, with uh, with CDP3, you still have the option to keep thousands of uh, of recovery points. Um, it's uh, the 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 new disk safe architecture is faster with compression. Again, we're uh, whereas in version two. The, the moment that you implemented compression, you saw uh, a dramatic decrease in, uh, in throughput. Um, CDP3 automatically adjusts for resized volume. So if you're using LVM and you have to uh, expand a, a logical volume in version 2, um, you had no choice but to do a complete uh, seed image of that backup. In version 3, that's no longer the case. You can repartition your machines and, uh, and, and keep going with your incremental backups without having to do uh, a complete uh, full backup again. And again, with, uh, with us, there is never any max storage files per size because uh, to us, files are just blocks on disk, so you'll never face any limitations. Um, file excludes uh, in version 2. People often said, well, I don't want to back up anything and everything on, uh, on the disk. So file excludes were introduced in, uh, in 3.0. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good feature, but be, uh, be mindful that um, light compression excludes have, uh, and have an overhead, um, especially if you are using any type of uh, using the, the wildcard feature of, uh, of the excludes. So, for example, if I want to exclude everything that ends with .log on the on the C drive, well, it's going to have to examine every single file uh, recursively on the C drive. That can take a long time, potentially minutes or hours, depending upon um, how many files and folders that you have. So, again, um, if you, if you have to do it, um, we we understand, and that's why we implemented the feature. But just be mindful. Of, uh, of the, the resources that it's going to take to uh, to accomplish accomplish such a uh, such a task, and uh, and lastly was uh, uh, our new compression option in version two. We we you had only one option, and that was to use VLib. In version three, we introduced uh, Quick LZ which I believe is a, a commercial compression library, but the results that we've had with it have been tremendous. Essentially, we're getting the, uh, the same compression ratios that we were with, uh, with ZWeb, but it's not having any type of impact on, uh, on throughput. If anything, it's making backups faster rather than slower. And, uh, and just some environmental recommendations here that uh, when it comes to uh, network attached storage uh, in, in version 3. Um, in, if you're using Windows Server 2008 storage server, um, we switch shares have, have always worked very well as, a, as have uh, NTFS partitions formatted with uh, 32K cluster sizes. Again, that's the same cluster size as the, the pages that our new uh, data structures use, so you will get some. Uh, you'll definitely realize some optimizations there on uh, on Linux, Linux machines. Um, NFS four is always uh, preferable with uh, with newer kernels, um, where version three is probably preferential with some uh, some older kernels. But this is something that uh, that that you should definitely uh, look at um, prior to uh, to deploying. Um, if you have the option of using ext4 or xfs, it's uh, it's definitely advisable because those uh, those file systems actually have defrag capabilities now as well. Uh, and just a, a few notes on on hardware here: um, direct attached storage arrays with uh, with battery backend controllers um, are always recommended. Uh, Data drives, if you can go in with fast drives, you will realize performance benefits. Again, the better the better hardware that you, you throw at the CDP server, the, the better performance you are going to realize. And we'll close with, uh, with just uh, a few screenshots here 
of, uh, of the new interface. Um, here we can see uh, this is kind of the, the reporting uh, snapshot of, uh, of a single backup. And as, if you take a look closer at, uh, at towards the bottom, you can see uh, performance statistics such as average throughput, um, the amount of data actually saved to disk, uh, peak throughput, minimum throughput, how long it took to take the snapshot, and how long it took to, to exclude the files. Um, if you look at the, the kind of the, the bar right above the, the progress bar where it says 100%, you can see the, the amount of runtime that it took and the, uh, the amount of uh, deltas that we received. But that is, uh, that is a very verbose uh, kind of counter there. It updates every five seconds. So for those of you who are used to the, the, the kind of the scrolling green bar on R1 so on in version 2 that jumped from 10 to 55 to 90, um, that is not the case anymore. You will know exactly what the, uh, the, the backup process is doing at, at, uh, at any given time. Just uh, a little snapshot of, uh, of the file excludes browser. And again, you could, uh, you could pick the, choose anything here if you don't want to back up the Windows install directory or the temp directory on Windows. Simply exclude those files from the backup. Uh, again, there's a, there's a new uh, file browser. I'm sure that many of you who are using version 2 who opened up a directory that had over 10,000 files in it often faced a, a browser crash. And um, that wasn't so much the, on the R1 soft side, it was on the browser side trying to load uh, a list with, uh, with X amount of objects in it. Um, in version 3, there's, uh, we implemented pagination. So you're not going to see um, that, uh, those types of limitations. And it's something that, uh, that you'll be able to search through here as, uh, as well. Uh, a new alerting feature to, to let you know of, uh, of anything that went wrong with, uh, with the system. And that, uh, that brings us to the, the conclusion here. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for, uh, for their time today. And I guess uh, I can now hand it back over to, to Liam and open it up for some hey, uh, questions. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we just leave it on the, on the slide that you've got up there? Uh, it's got your contact info, so people can make a note of that while we do this. But uh, uh, we can just ask, I can just ask you a few questions while, while, while we, that slide is just fine. <laughs> um, I guess I, I, one thing I'd like to talk about a bit is, is, is the sort of process of upgrading to, to 3.0. Is, is there a, I mean, is there a specific something? Right, so with that, 3.0 was, uh, was really completely re-architected. So, um, the, uh, the, the new data structure format really prevented us from maintaining an, uh, an, an upgrade path between two and three. It's something we wanted to do, and it's something that we put engineering time behind to see if, it were, if an upgrade path was, uh, was actually feasible. Um, our, our test just showed that with, uh, with the amount of customers that we have out there right now, and the, uh, and the size of some of the, the data stores that we were looking at converting from 2.0 to 3.0, it just wasn't feasible. So what, we're, what we want to do now is help our customers and uh, to migrate from 2.0 to 3.0. And essentially, it, it involves running concurrent setup. So bringing down your install of 2.0 and bringing up an install of 3.0. Okay, and you said that that's a that's a process that you guys are going to be involved with with the customer. Well, well, I mean, of course, we're we're, we're here for them to uh, to to assist. Um, the the main kind of uh, limitation that or problem that we see is with that with the licensing. So the customers will essentially, if you have, say, you're backing up ten machines on one server, and you're ready to start migrating, you say, okay, well, I want to. This weekend, I'm going to move five of them over to CDP3. Well, guess what? You're going to need a new license key for, uh, for CDP3. So we'll, we'll allow you to keep your old backups for, uh, for the 10 machines on, the, on CDP2 and then work with you on, uh, on giving you a license to help you migrate 
your environment to route to CDP3. Okay, and for people who maybe are are listening to the webinar and aren't aren't uh, currently customers, um, how does the pricing work for for the software in general, either two or three? Well, I won't. I'm not going to. I'm not into sales per se, so I'm not. I can't comment on uh, on the uh, on specific pricing. But I will say this: that um, that the the licensing model is on a per agent basis. So there's not a there's not a charge for the server side. Uh, if you want to back up ten machines, you buy ten agents. That that that's it. Um, and then if you want any of the additional add-on modules. The, the MySQL add-on or the or the archiving add-on, those are uh, those are additional components on top of the uh, the agent cost. Okay, um, I guess. And, to, and and last thing, I just want to say though, we are also introducing a new subscription pricing model. Um, I can't tell you how many hosting customers we had uh, wanted a, such, a a subscription model where they uh, where they would pay uh, a monthly fee for the agents used. That is now introduced. Okay, great. That's actually a really good lead into the sort of next sort of thing I wanted to talk about, which was, I guess, as far as migrating from from two to three, um, when you're a service provider who has you know customers that you're selling the product to, or, or at least employing the product for. Uh, I mean, how is that migration going to look to the end user? Is that going to be sort of transparent? Well, um, it. I don't think it would be uh, completely transparent um, because there is, uh, in order to upgrade from two to three, it would require an upgrade of uh, of the agent. You have to uninstall uh, one version of the agent and uh, and install a new version of the agent. Um, so it would uh, it would require uh, just a, a a little bit of work on uh, on the agent side, not just that, but to to, to move from the the old install format. To uh, to act in Yum, once you make the transition, you can you can schedule a cron job in uh, in after with after Yum that says, hey, if I update my kernel, I'm going to update R1 soft as uh, as well. So it may just require a little bit of effort on uh, on the front end, but the the benefits you get on the on the back end um, are, are are worth it. Okay, and and again, I'm, I'd love to touch on this just just generally for the people who might not already be a, a customer of our OneSoft. But um, service providers who provide uh, the CDP functions to their customers—I mean, is there is there a very typical pricing model or a way of distributing it that, that is pretty much used across the board, or are there a lot of variations there? No. The, okay. So the the two biggest. Uh, I guess the the two most popular pricing models are either a a flat fee, saying that I'm going to charge you X amount of dollars to to manage uh, your backups per month, or b um, kind of uh, just uh, a pay as you bill when it comes to storage. So we're going to implement the infrastructure, we're going to install the agent, we're going to manage the backups, but you pay for the amount of storage that you use on the backend. So those are probably the the two most popular pricing models that we were we're currently seeing. Okay, um, I think that might be about it for questions. I know I know you uh, you put together the presentation, so I don't know that, that that there would necessarily be anything that you wanted to touch on that hasn't already been touched on. But is there is there anything else that you wanted to get to? No, I mean I just uh, for for anybody that's uh, that's out there and listening to this, I, I highly encourage you to uh, to download three Right now, it's uh, it's it's on our website. You can download it, um, you can install it, you can play with it, and we uh, we welcome your your feedback and input on it. Okay, great. Well, we're we're a few minutes shy of the hour here, but I think that's probably about it for for what we're going to do. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank everyone for attending, and uh, of course, I want to thank Ash for providing us some some excellent insight into the uh, new functions of a really cool product. And uh, finally, I'd like to remind everyone that an archived copy of the webinar will be online at thewar.com slash webinars by first thing next week, uh, along with archived copies of a lot of other great webinar content that we've done in the past. And uh, thanks very much, everyone, and have a great day.